Dina and I were having a conversation about the Muslim religion, and we both realized there's so much information that we don't have. And we also realized that we really don't have a Muslim friend that we could go to and ask questions. But as fate would have it, we were at the Miami Book Fair, and we bumped into a group of Muslims whose mission was to explain to everybody else what they're all about and answer any questions and clear up any misconceptions they may get from the media. Well, the name of our organization, first of all, thank you very much for actually talking to us. Um, so the name of our organization is the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community. So we're a branch of Islam that believes in the Messiah. And what we're doing, we have several campaigns. Muslims for Peace is one of them. We have Muslims for Loyalty, because loyalty to one's nation is actually part of the Islamic faith. So we have a campaign that lets people know that it's actually part of our faith to be nationalistic and contra you know, contrary to what you see a lot of in the world today. Um, we also have a Muslims for Life campaign. And what we've been doing is we've been collecting blood to donate throughout the community and all of our local communities to save the lives of our fellow Americans. You know, so these are just some of the things that we've been doing to let people know that we really stand for peace. We love all mankind. And really what we're here to do is try to dispel this false ideology that's being perpetuated throughout the world about Islam. Well, if you wanted to dispel this ideology, what would you start with? Education. And education lets you know what does the religion actually say and what are these people doing and understanding that they're two completely disparate things. Well, how would you go about educating the public? As it is, as you said, you were surprised that we even came over to speak to you. Well, I got, I, I got to tell you, it, you know, the, every, the media always asks, where are the moderate Muslims? And the answer is, we're here. Anytime there's a terrorist attack, anytime there's anything terrible like this that happens, our community has always put out a press release and tried to get out into the media to denounce that type of behavior. We completely do not support any form of terrorism whatsoever. The problem comes when, how does that message get spread to the rest of the world? What do you think is the biggest misconception that the rest of the world has about Muslims? Well, I, I think the biggest min misconception is that all Muslims are alike. Well, one of the misconceptions that I've heard repeatedly that most Muslims are, are loyal to the Koran and secondary loyal to whatever nation they just happen to be living in. Within the Muslim religion, I, I, I'm aware there are Sunnis and there are Shia, and I'm, now I'm learning there are even other tribes which are maybe not as big or significant, but a part of these different groups. What is it that's keeping these people from getting along together and then having this overflow and, and affecting the rest of the world? So, first of all, you're correct. I mean, Islam is divided into many different sects, of which we are one. So we are called the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. What's different about us is that we are Muslims who believe in the Messiah. We believe that the Messiah has come, that the entire world has been waiting for. And we believe that he has a successor, and our fifth, we are currently on the fifth successor. So it's hard for me to speak for every single sect and every single community. It would be the same as saying, well, you're Catholic. What do you think about the Lutherans, the Methodists, the, you know, Seventh day Adventists, etc.? Why aren't they saying the same thing you're saying? So there are fundamental differences and they're in the interpretation of the Holy Quran. What I can do is speak for ourselves and the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is one of those communities our motto is and has always been love for all hatred for none so in that regard we believe that man is here for two reasons one is to worship the almighty god and two is to take care of his creation mankind and those are the two purposes in your life what we believe is that the messiah has come for the reformation of all of mankind so we believe that in all of the prophets of God previously, including, you know, from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Jesus to Moses, all of them. And we believe that Jesus was the Messiah of his time, as Christians believe, that he came to um, 
kind of remediate and kind of repeat those teachings of the of the Holy Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, because people had lost their ways. Similarly, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had predicted that the state of Islam would decline, that it would not be the same type of religion that was revealed to him, that it would go through a period where it would continually denigrate until the reformer of the time would come. So we believe that religion is kind of an evolution from the beginning to the end. But do you believe that the world that's going to come with this Messiah is going to be like a caliphate? No. So it doesn't say anywhere that everybody will convert to the exact same religion and everybody will be the same. That's not what it is. We believe, according to the Holy Quran, there's a term used that there's people of the book. So the, the Islam is very different in that it's, you know, it basically gives everybody individual responsibility for salvation. So how good you are, what your beliefs are, how you live your life and the deeds that you do, those will ultimately judge how you do in the afterlife according to Islamic belief. So the ultimate decision is left up to God Almighty. It's your duty to lead your life as good as possible. We look alike. We do. You know, you got a beard, I have a mustache. You know, we both have our own original hair. We both wear glasses. What's the difference? Well, this is the key thing, and I think you hit right on it. We don't, as, as people and human beings, we don't have to agree on every single point. What we do have to do is to learn to respect each other. Oh, well, isn't it true that in order to respect somebody, you got to know them and not just make them them or, or people or what, you know, are you all like that? But as an individual with a name and a face, I, and once right. I get to know you and if I like you, well, then you'll become my friend and then we won't think of you as a Muslim and as a non-Muslim or an infidel or what, whatever the, the, the wrong term. The line is we're all people. And you got to get to know each other and learn about each other and respect each other. And that's where it comes from. It comes from knowing, it comes from learning, and it comes from education. Well, that says it all. Thank you very much. In our conversation, we got around to the subject of women covering their heads with scarves. And instead of answering the question himself, he said, why not speak to one of the ladies here and she can explain it to you. I've been posed a question as to why do Muslim women cover, and it is perceived as a sense of uh, deprivation and a self-inflicted uh, kind of calling uh, when men are not supposed to uh, be judged by the same criteria. Actually, when women choose to cover, they are following an injunction of the Quran, which is basically the Quran specifies the spirit of modesty, and this is to protect your chastity. And before, when the Quran tells women to cover, before that, it tells the men to lower your gaze. So just like you have a precious pearl, it needs more protection. It's going to be covered by the shell. Women are objectified, and they are used, uh, you know, and uh, men, if they get uh, to see women, uh, it's a it's a natural phenomenon that uh, men would be incited by that, and so it's basically the it's for the protection of women. And I can speak for myself as a Muslim woman who chooses to cover herself, and I have worn the veil since I was 15. And I I went to school, college. I worked for a multinational company. I have a master's in business administration. So when the question comes, it has to come from within. You have to understand the spirit of it. And personally for me, I can vouch that adopting the veil has in fact liberated me. It sounds a little... How so? How so? I know it sounds uh, a counter narrative uh, like to the question that's been posed to me, but it has in fact. I feel that when I cover, I will not be judged by my appearance. I'll be judged by my thought process and my mind, the things that are more valuable when I'm speaking here, it's not dissuading me from interacting or it would be, if it was an impediment to my progress, my, my physical or like the secular progress, then I believe, yes, then that's an impediment. And some cultures take it to that extreme that they don't want women to be seen, but that's not the spirit of the veil. I've noticed couples that the woman walks several steps behind the man. Why? What is the reason for that? There is no Islamic 
rationale for that. It's the cultural. I come back to that. It's a cultural interpretation because there are certain societies that are repressive. You have to separate religion from culture. Now, my big question is, how do you explain this to people who are not Muslim and don't understand that it's really based on a, a cultural difference more so than a religious difference, but it's the cultural difference that seems to frighten, for lack of a better word, American women, because they're always, oh, look at that, look at that woman, she's all covered you up, see, blah, I'm blah, blah. Here. I'm a testament to that fact that what I'm saying, I believe in that. I'm here, I'm talking to you, and I'm explaining my viewpoint. We are talking about this issue. Gender inequality is ingrained in the system, and it's not about being judged by different criteria, it's about different roles. Women and men have equal but important, equal, but separate roles in society. Not to say that they cannot interchange, but that's how God made them. Okay, one, one more question. What do you think is the biggest misconception that non-Muslims have about Muslims? It's not Islam that is uh, prohibiting women from achieving their potential and from empowering them. It's the culture. And men, and then when we come about you know, women as uh, being abused and being sick is a second star, then, you know, there should not be any women abuse in the United States. Women are still being abused. Yes. And since we are talking about women's issue, the, I would suggest my friends and my fellow country Americans, if you're a Muslim or non-Muslim, please read about the Prophet Muhammad. Pick a book from here, Life of Muhammad, and see how he led his life. You will find the social, the economic, and the political. His example is one that can save humanity. And as a Muslim woman, I stand here as a testament to that belief. If I tell my friends that I was, my family, my ancestors were Hindu, and in that time, infanticide was being practiced in India, it still is, and had my family not converted to Islam, I would have been dead. You would not see me here. I might have been buried alive for being a girl. So I owe my life to Prophet Muhammad. Well, I'm, I'm glad because I'm very happy to see you here and meet you today. Thank you so much. And you've given me a lot of information to and think you know, about. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. After the interviews with Taha and Minsura, Stuart and I realized that the more we think we are unique because of our religions and cultures, the more it seems we're alike.